In this second video of my Lyrical Prose 101 series, I take a look at some specific examples of lyrical language in middle grade fiction and how they work to make the writing more lyrical and enhance the reader's experience. Welcome writers, I'm Renee Latulipe with the Lyrical Language Lab, the place for children's writers to learn all you need to know about rhyme, meter, and lyrical language. This is the second of four videos in my Lyrical Prose 101 series. If you didn't see the first one, you'll find it right here. So give that a click and take a look so that you'll be up to speed on all the definitions and terminology that I'll be using throughout the series. As I mentioned, today I'll be looking at Lyrical Prose in middle grade fiction, but first let's start with a quick review of what exactly is Lyrical Prose. In the first video, I defined lyrical prose as any writing that uses poetic techniques to enhance the poetry and musicality of the language. I'd like to expand on that a little bit here and add that lyrical prose is rich, layered, and descriptive without being overwrought or overly sentimental, without getting into that purple prose area that I mentioned in the first video. It also creates and conveys cohesive images with fresh but natural language, and it is simply rhythmic, poetic, and musical. The best way to get a feel for lyrical prose is to read, read, read. And my first stop would be the list of Newbery winners and honor books, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. Remember, in my first video, I quoted uh, an author who said that literary fiction is all that stuff that wins the awards, right? And I can guarantee you that all those books on the Newbery list are full of lyrical language. As we go through the samples I'm sharing today and in your own future reading, I want you to start to be really aware of the author's craft. In particular, start looking at things like when and how imagery, simile, metaphor, and other figurative language is used and how it supports the story. When and how sound devices are used and the effect that those have the use of specific diction and how that supports the story, and the rhythms, cadences, and pauses within the writing. Now let's get down to what lyrical language actually looks like in a real life book. So I'm going to be sharing with you the sample I use in my Lyrical Language Lab course, so you're getting a sneak peek into one of my lessons, and that is Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech. Now, this is a Newbery winner, and it is an older book. It came out in 1994. And yes, of course, you can find plenty of lyrical language in contemporary books, but there's a reason that I always use this one, and I always will, is that Almost every poetic technique I know of is used in, within the first couple of chapters. I actually set up a web page for you so you can see my full analysis of this sample, and I'm putting that link down in the description for you. So do be sure to check that out, or you might want to open it now and follow along. As you can see here in this full sample, I've got a whole color-coded extravaganza going on here, and all of those things are explained on the web page that I'm going to link to. Uh, so let's zoom in and just look at a few of these things. The first thing I want to point out in this are these red areas that are the imagery, figurative language, simile, and metaphor. Remember in the first video, I harped on the fact that our imagery needs to be cohesive and make sense for the story that we're telling. And Creech is a master at this. Uh, Walk Two Moons is about a girl who grows up in Bybanks, Kentucky. We know she's a country girl, one, because she tells us uh, so herself in the very first chapter. So look at these um, examples of imagery. She's in Bybanks, Kentucky, which is not much more than a caboodle of houses roosting. And then right after that, my father plucked me up like a weed. So this idea of a caboodle of houses roosting obviously is completely authentic to this country girl. It's a, cab I mean, and what a great word is caboodle, by the way. It is true to her experience. And the fact that her father plucked her up like a weed adds even more to that experience, her experience of growing up in the country. And that kind of thing just keeps coming. Uh, the houses were all jammed together like a row of birdhouses. Again, country imagery. The country imagery continues. Again, we're still in the first couple of chapters uh, when she speaks about her grandparents and she says, trouble just naturally followed them like a filly trailing behind a mare. 
I don't think I need to explain any more about how wonderful all of this is and how it is so cohesive. And over here at the end, sometimes I am as ornery and stubborn as an old donkey. My father says I lean on broken reeds and will get a face full of swamp mud one day. It's just fabulous. Every single image that I just read to you is, is about the country and just reinforces this girl and her experience and her character. The second technique I want to point out is her diction, just her word choice, and how also that is authentic to each character. And these are the ones that are kind of fuchsia here. So we have grandma and grandpa who are eccentric characters. And the first thing we hear Gramps say in this is, we'll see the whole ding dong country. They're going on a road trip. And then Graham squeezes her cheeks and says, you're my favorite little chickabitty. All right, where, where do these words come from? Only Grams and Gramps know. Uh, they talk about things not being worth a hill of beans, which could be a cliche, but coming, but it's completely authentic, even being cliche, coming out of the mouths of Gramps and Grams. This goes on. Um, I'm, they would have said that I might as well try to catch a fish in the air. Again, all of these colloquialisms of Graham and Grams are absolutely authentic to who they are. One poetic technique that Sharon Creech uses a lot in this book and that I just adore is repetition. And she uses it so well. One, to give us more insight into the emotional state of the character and characters. Uh, it helps create a rhythm and also humor. Repetition is really good at for, for creating humor as well. So let's take a look at those. Those are the purple areas. And we start with this um, Bybanks, Kentucky. She mentions that several times that she's in Bybanks. But we have this um, lady with wild red hair. And our protagonist does not care for this lady with the wild red hair. And she says it a lot. A lady with wild red hair stood there. Hmm? And then her back, the lady with the wild red hair. And she knows her name, but she doesn't call her by the name. She just calls her the lady with the wild red hair, which already tells us something about her attitude. So this lady with the wild red hair is named Margaret. And we do have that name here. Don't be a goose. Come and see Margaret. I did not want to see Margaret. This repetition adds humor. As does this little repetition at the end when she's again describing her grandparents. My grandparents' hiddle were my father's parents, full up to the tops of their heads with goodness and sweetness and... Mixed in with all that goodness and sweetness was a large dash of peculiarity. So we're getting that they're definitely good and sweet, but they're also something else. And one of the most poignant uh, uses of repetition in this particular one is um, this protagonist is without a mom. And here are some of the reasons uh, that she is about to embark on a trip with Graham and Gramps to find the mom. And she makes a little list here. Some of the real reasons were Graham and Gramps wanted to see Mama, who was resting peacefully in Lewiston, Idaho. Graham and Gramps knew that I wanted to see Mama, but that I was afraid to. Dad wanted to be alone with the red-headed Margaret Cadaver. He had already seen Mama, and he had not taken me. Of course, names as well. This woman is named Margaret Cadaver, for heaven's sake. So we have wanted to see Mama, wanted to see Mama, had already seen Mama, and this repetition of mama, mama, mama gives me, again, an idea into the emotional state of this girl. And although the tone of this is kind of arm's length, you know also that it's a self-preservation technique on the part of this young girl who is missing her mama. So there's so much wrapped up into this use of repetition. And finally, for this example, we have a nice use of sound as well. Uh, during the week before we left, the sound of the wind was hurry, hurry, hurry. And at night, even the silent darkness whispered, rush, rush, rush. So she's got onomatopoeia in here, as well as personification here with the darkness. The darkness is whispering, rush, rush, rush. And again, this creates such a mood and anticipation on the part of the protagonist. Again, you'll find a more in-depth analysis of this snippet at the web page that is linked below in the description. But I did want to share with you some other quick samples that I just pulled off my shelf randomly and I just opened them up to a page and found so many treasures.
The first is A Corner of the Universe by Anne M. Martin. It's a book from 2002, and it did win a Newbery Honor. And it's actually written in very simple language, but it's beautiful, and it's easy, and it flows so rhythmically, uh, and it's all so authentic to the 11-year-old protagonist's voice. Even when we write in very simple language, there are always opportunities to surprise the reader with beautiful language. And in particular, I really enjoyed how she described time. There's been a death in the family and she is describing the passage of time. And she says, time has been passing the way it did when I was six and got the measles and had to stay in bed forever. Notice that there are no adverbs in this little snippet because we don't need adverbs. Time did not pass slowly. Instead, the author creates an image that we can relate to, that the character herself can relate to because it's her experience. And so therefore it is authentic to this character. Time isn't passing slowly. It's passing like it did when she was six. And when you're six, being sick with the measles does feel like forever. My next sample is The Bridge Home by Padma Venkatraman, which just came out in 2019. And I love Padma's verse novels. And I have to admit that I was three chapters into this book before I realized I wasn't reading a verse novel. That's how poetic it is. And it also made me cry like a baby, but I digress. This is a great example of metaphor and how it is authentic to the character's experience and how it also shows her relationship to another character. So let me just read this. She's describing her father, her Appa. Imagining Appa before took a lot of imagining. I was a good imaginer, but even so, I couldn't imagine him all the way nice. The best I could do was think of him as a not yet all the way rotten fruit a plump yellow mango with just a few ugly bruises. What a metaphor. And it goes on. I could imagine our mother picking him out the way she'd pick fruit from the grocer's stall, choosing the overripe fruit he was happy to give her for free. I could see Ama looking Appa over, hoping that if certain foul bits could be cut away, then sweetness, pure sweetness, would be left behind. How beautiful is that? Not only is this metaphor authentic to the setting and to the characters themselves, it also gives us this wonderful glimpse into their daily life, going to the market. And I love the way that it compares choosing the husband to choosing a piece of fruit. So something really important to something so banal that happens every day. And beyond that, this metaphor takes us to a whole new emotional level where we get insight not only into the narrator's state of mind and state of emotion, but also her mother's back when she was choosing this husband. All wrapped up into a fruit metaphor. Amazing. In the next sample, I want to take you all the way back to 1937 with Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Just listen to how she creates a character through lyrical language. It's kind of amazing. Mrs. Bogle came walking down the street towards the porch. Mrs. Bogle, who was many times a grandmother, but had a blushing air of coquetry about her that cloaked her sunken cheeks. You saw a fluttering fan before her face and a magnolia blooms and sleepy lakes under the moonlight when she walked. There was no obvious reason for it. It was just so. She was a wind on the ocean. She moved men but the helm determined the port. And I have nothing to add to that because it's absolute perfection. I do think that their eyes were watching God is more YA, but I just could not resist including it. It's just so fabulous. Um, so getting back to some middle grade, and this is a younger middle grade, I have The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. And this is a book from 1984, so it's another classic. And I have to say that this book is pure poetry. If you want a really quick study in simile, metaphor, lyrical language, imagery, everything, read it because it's all in here. I opened it up randomly and I, I could just pick any page, any page at all. It is full. I picked one. It's a little chapter called Hairs. It's just a description of hairs. Everybody in our family has different hair. My papa's hair is like a broom, simile, all up in the air. 
And me, my hair is lazy, personification. It never obeys barrettes or bands. Carlos's hair is thick and straight. He doesn't need to comb it. Nanny's hair is slippery, slides out of your hand. And Kiki, who is the youngest, has hair like fur. But my mother's hair, my mother's hair, repetition. Like little rosettes, like little candy circles, all curly and pretty because she pinned it in pin curls all day. Sweet to put your nose into when she is holding you, holding you and, feel, and you feel safe, repetition. Is the warm smell of bread before you bake it? Is the smell when she makes room for you on her side of the bed, still warm with her skin and you sleep near her? The rain outside falling and Papa snoring. The snoring, the rain, and Mama's hair that smells like bread. You hear all that repetition? It's fabulous, it's so beautiful. I could redo this whole book <laughs> just because it's so great. All right, I'll do one more just really quick on laughter and she's describing laughter and again this is surprising language whenever we do similes and metaphors and imagery we want to surprise the reader give them something they haven't heard before so she's talking about different types of laughter and her friend nanny and we are more alike than you would know our laughter for example not the shy ice cream bells giggle of rachel and lucy's family but all of a sudden and surprised, like a pile of dishes breaking. Laughter described as the bell on the ice cream truck and a pile of dishes breaking. These are two comparisons I have never heard before. So yeah, you're gonna to wanna to read this one. I know when we're looking for comp titles for our own writing, our own manuscripts, we tend to look in the last 10 years, things that were published more recently. However, today I really wanted to show you a range from across the ages of lyrical language to make a point. These lyrical prose books, this literary fiction, seem to be the ones that stand the test of time and become our beloved classics that are taught in English classes all over the country. And whether it was published yesterday or in 1937, it doesn't matter. We have so much to learn from all of these beautiful books. And I will put links to all the ones I use today in the description below. If you really want to get the hang of writing lyrical prose, spend some quality time with a nice stack of books, curl up in your favorite reading spot, and start flipping through the pages in search of lyrical passages. And if you do find a treasure, please leave me the book title and author in the comments below, and I'll add it to my list in the description so we can all take a look at it. Oh, and I encourage you to read these passages out loud so you can really live the literature and hear all the sounds and rhythms created by these amazing authors. Thanks for joining me. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing and then hit that notification bell so you don't miss any videos. And we'll see you here next week for video number three in Lyrical Prose 101. Ciao for now.